Okay, so we, we finished with percolation, and uh, so basically we proved the Cardi's formula, and then uh, convergence to SCL was an exercise, yes? Yeah, so it's uh, essentially doesn't, isn't it uh, any different from uh, uh, uniform spanning tree or loop or raised random walk. If we have some observable, we can easily uh, get SCL, provided we have a priori estimates, and for percolation, it's just through the same or Welsh theory, which gives a priori estimates. So what, what I will speak uh, today about is the easing model. So, um, okay, let's say the easing model. Uh, so uh, I will uh, try to explain in the next three lectures how we uh, proof, um, so it's a theorem uh, joined with Dima Chelkak and uh, in some stronger form also with Hugo, uh, Dominio and Antje Kempinen and Clement Angler. Uh, so uh, uh, theorem is that uh, basically uh, interfaces uh, in the spin easing model at critical temperature converge to SLE3 and interfaces in the FK representation of the easing model converge to SLE 16 over 3. So the, mm, the, first, the, first, the first one is uh, uh, maybe sort of the easiest. You take easing model at critical temperature, which has boundary condition of dibrusion pluses and minuses. Uh, and then uh, there will be a unique interface which runs from A to B. So it will look something like that. So it has minuses on one side and pluses on other side. And there might be also some loops which separate pluses from minuses. So there might be. But there will be unique interface from A to B. And it converges to silly 3. Now, um, it holds in a fairly general setting. So it's, uh, the way we prove it is uh, for the uh, is the radiographs. So the radiographs are graphs such that every face can be inscribed in a circle of same radius. So the radio means that there exists, uh, let's say, epsilon, which plays the role of lattice mesh, so that every face can be inscribed into epsilon circle. And if G is the radio, if you take G uh, together with uh, G star, which is the dual, then you get a tiling by rhombi. So this is fairly clear because if you have some graph and there is a face which can be, let's say, inscribed into a circle, then we can take the we can take the center of this circle, and the center of this circle uh, has distance epsilon to all the vertices. Then we take the center of this circle, which has distance epsilon to all the vertices. Then we take, uh, so there is, let's say, uh, one more, something like that. So if you take, if you take uh, our graph, uh, uh, so white is the graph G, 
And then, uh, let's say, this is the graph G star. So the graph G star looks something like that. So if you erase G G star and just leave the radio of the circle, you get a tiling by Rombay where, where everything, uh, well, like all the things are, well, it's not uh, quite a Rombay I've drawn, well, this more like a rhombus. Um, so um, I won't uh, do it in this generality, but just, just a remark why it works nicely in this generality, uh, because uh, there is a nice definition of what is critical temperature for, for such graphs. So one can tell for easing what are the interaction for every edge just in terms of angles at this edge. And this is related to integrability notions. This is related to, uh, well, you, you've heard probably of the young baxter transformation so that you, you can do star triangle transformation in a, in a graph uh, with the easing model and if you had here Boltzmann weights J1, J2, J3. There are unique Boltzmann weights J1 prime, J1 2 prime, J3 prime, so that it doesn't change the global partition function. So for Rombay tiling, that has very nice geometric meaning because what we have here in this picture, we have uh, three, well, I, I did it poorly. So we have in this picture three Rombay. So basically this star, it corresponds to yeah, let me draw it separately. It corresponds to three rhombi. Okay, so uh, uh, yeah, the star corresponds to three rhombi. And now, if you have three rhombi, you can do in the same hexagon picture like that, and then uh, this is corresponds to the triangle. So rhombi tiling, they have geometrically built in this star triangle transformation on the geometric level. Of course, this doesn't mean that there, there are any ways for the easing model, which nicely I agree. But it turns out that they are, there are, and they, they are basically the weight for some edge is, will be just, uh, uh, well, tangent of this angle or something like that. So it's, uh, uh, OK, so this is the generality in which it holds. So in particular, uh, it holds for all uh, regular lattices because every regular lattice, square, hexagonal, triangular, every face can be inscribed in the circle of the same radius. Uh, and um, what I will do, I will do instead everything for the square lattice. And the difference, uh, what one has to do more if one wants to do for the general graphs, well, uh, Basically, uh, basically, there are two differences. So that's uh, uh, all the lemmas I will state they hold for is a radio graphs, but one has to be more careful with the formal ways because there will be weights which depend on the angles. And also, if you do it for general graphs, you cannot use any a priori estimates which we know for the easing model. So for easing model, we know some calculations of Anzager, so we already know certain things, how partition function behaves since like 60 years ago. And for these radio graphs, it's one has to prove it from scratch. So, uh, and essentially that uh, doesn't mean that you have to prove from scratch conformal invariance, but a priori estimates, you have to do something which for square lattice was known, known long ago. So this is uh, holds for this, but we'll do for square lattice instead. Uh, so we'll do for square lattice instead. OK, and time permitting, I will also say a few words uh, uh, how one can deduce things without appealing to SLE. So in principle, the object we will construct, uh, one can um, either relate interfaces to SLE, and then it gives you access to dimensions and SLE calculations. But in, on the other hand, one can just play with this object and get all the dimensions from this object and different constructs based on it. So it's. Uh, alternative route uh, to using a silly. Of course, the really interesting question is whether one can uh, construct any so anything like that for other models, like, for example, POTS model or FK model with other values of parameters. So this, this and this, this, so far I don't know. Okay, so we'll start with the FK easing model. 
Uh, so uh, a short reminder, or maybe a, a reminder. So FK uh, model, so it's also called, so it's FK stands for Fortuin Castellane, or, or equivalently, one says a random cluster. Uh, so uh, our setup is, is uh, uh, the following. So we have a piece of a square lattice. And then we draw some configuration. that can happen. And the partition uh, function uh, is just uh, the sum. <coughs> so we'll have a parameter square root of Q. Uh, so the uh, partition function is the sum over all cluster configurations square root of q to the power number of clusters oops sorry q to the power number of clusters and then people either write p to the power number of blue bonds and 1 minus p to the power number of other bonds uh, so uh, 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 or just p to the power over 1 minus p to the power number of open bones. So that, that <coughs> definition you have had in the course, yes? And you had a theorem that uh, for example, magnetization in easing model is just probability of uh, having a connection. So uh, correlation of two spins can be written as probability of having a connection. Yeah. So Q, Q equal 2 corresponds to the easing. Q equal 2. Uh, so critical value uh, PC is square root of Q over 1 plus square root of Q. That's a theorem of Hugo and Van Sun, the Fara, uh, so that's the uh, uh, Fara and Geminil. So for for easing PC is square root of two or one plus square root of two. So that 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 was known before and basically falls from Kramer and Vanier. Now uh, uh, we do. Uh, here, Dabrushian boundary conditions. So there are two points, let's say, point A somewhere here, point B somewhere here. So AB is wired, and arc BA is, well, usually people say we do wired, because there is obvious duality in this model when you switch between P and 1 minus P, and uh, Basically, the duality you can just pass to the dual graph. And on the dual graph, you draw the edges whenever there are no edges on the original lattice. Okay, so that's some picture like that. So let me just make some. Uh, one. So one can pass from blue picture to yellow picture and uh, what changes is that uh, uh, you basically alternate between uh, uh, open, so your open bonds become closed bonds and the other way around, so, so bas bas basic basically you get the same, the same partition function. Uh, so. Um, 
in these boundary conditions, there is a unique curve which goes from A to B in between, between these two things. So there are also a number of loops. So this means that uh, there is an interface from A to B. Now, uh, when FK model was discussed, did you rewrite it in terms of loops or not? You did. Ah, OK, very good. So it's, uh, uh, OK, so I will just draw this immediately as a loop. So it's basically uh, we have loops on the medial lattice. So at PC, equivalent model, uh, so we take loop loops on medial lattice plus interface from A to B. And the partition function is uh, sum of our uh, loop configurations, loop configurations, square root of q to the power number of loops. So basically, uh, on, on that, if we do it, uh, well, let me just do it in the picture as above. So we have have some picture like that and then we look look at how it can be split into loops so it's uh, example well there will be one interface and then a number of, of loops so this is a typical configuration And the boundary condition is just that there is one source, one thing. So there are two vertices with odd number of edges. So there will be something running from here to here. And that's the partition function. So if P is not equal to PC, then you would also have a factor here depending on a uh, number of uh, vertical horizontal connections. So it won't be, if P is not equal to PC, it's not written nicely in terms of loops, but if P is equal to PC, you get exactly this. So this, this you have done, yeah? Okay, very good. So, so this is the picture, and uh, in principle, one can just start off directly with it uh, without any appeal to the easing model. Uh, so for simplicity, maybe in one place, we'll use the relation to the easing model. So what's the relation to the easing model? So the uh, relation to the easing model is, uh, well, for example, probability that this yellow curve passes through a point. What is this probability? This probability that this interface passes through a point, meaning that there is a yellow connection to a uh, point nearby and a blue connection to a point nearby. And what is yellow connection to the point nearby? It's uh, in terms of the original Ising model, it's probability that the spin here is plus given that we magnetize the lower part of the boundary. So in particular, from the easing model, we know that this probability is small when you are far away from the boundary. That's from the original estimates. So here we can deduce, uh, so if, if it's far from the bottom. On the other hand, if it's far from the top, it's the other way around. We know that blue probability is small. So in either way, either way, probability of passing through a given edge is small. And we can move it here. So the original knowledge of the easing model that we know that magnetization at criticality is small, it means that there is a small probability to pass through a given edge. So the curve is not space filling. So this, this is a bit of information we can uh, deduce, uh, which we will need. We can deduce it uh, from what we'll be doing, but one can also deduce it from the classical results about the easing model, that this curve is not space filling. OK. Now, so this is the setup. Uh, and. Uh, <coughs> What we'll do, we will uh, 
consider the following uh, function. So let's let's define define a function. So okay. So given given a discrete domain omega with points a and b. Define on edges uh, the function. So for a given edge z, uh, define for for an edge z function f of z. Uh, so uh, the uh, first basic idea what one can look for in this picture, well, we have this distinguished curve. So let's just look at the probability that this curve passes through z. So the first thing one can uh, want is to uh, write the probability that z belongs to this curve. Let me denote this gamma. So interface mm. so it's expectation that of characteristic function that z belongs to gamma. So this is just probability that gamma passes through z. Yeah. Now, if you look at it, uh, nothing nice comes out of it, unfortunately. So we, we want to make it slightly more complicated. Uh, so we want to count differently different curves. But uh, we want to have some property of a curve which will have a nice control over. And uh, it turns out that uh, the basic, well, Essentially, the only property we have nice control over, well, we, can, we have control over how long this curve uh, it seems. But then when we start rearranging the picture, it doesn't work so well. Uh, so, uh, so what kinds of rearrangement of the picture we can do? We can, for example, attach this, this, uh, loop, this thing to the curve, this, this loop. And uh, length doesn't, doesn't behave very well because when we're attaching at this point a loop, we don't know how big the loop is. But what we can control is uh, how uh, many turns this piece of the curve undergoes. Because if you attach some loop, if you have certain number of turns, for example, in this picture, it's one full turn, 360 degrees. If you attach some loop, the total number of turns doesn't change. Just for topological reasons, because you attach something on the side, it doesn't cross. So this is essentially the only thing we can have a control over. So what, uh, what we can uh, put here as, a, uh, as an additional term is, let's say, lambda to the power number of uh, turns of gamma from, uh, let's say, well, A to Z or B to Z doesn't really matter, uh, from, let's say, B to Z. So let's say number of turns our curve goes, undergoes when you go from Take this half. So this is B and A. Now, number of terms, uh, uh, I mean with sign. So this is, uh, so this uh, uh, means, of course, with sign. So this is, uh, let's say, minus one turn. And this is plus one turn. So basically, if we have a picture which goes like that, then the weight will be lambda to the power 0, which is equal to 1. So uh, no matter how, how you, you crazy you go, it still will be the same. Because 
the total winding will be zero. Now, for example, if I have picture which goes like this, what will be the net number of turns? So it's, uh, well, on this specific picture I've drawn, there will be one turn to the right and one, two, three, four, five turns to the left. So the difference is five minus one is equal to four, so it will be uh, uh, lambda to the power of four. And no matter how you, I perturb this picture, it will be the same. On the other hand, uh, well, you, you can, all, all, of course, also have more complicated, so this will be lambda to the power 8, or you can have on the other, um, you can do it from the other side, so this is lambda to the power minus 4. And, uh, of course, it doesn't need to be always divisible by 4. I, I, I can easily come up with something else, so it's, uh, uh, for example, this one will be lambda squared, so I do not 360 degree turn, but 180. So essen essen essentially this, this weight we have, it's uh, lambda to the power number of turns. So one can rewrite it as, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, lambda to the power the total winding of the curve of uh, gamma from B to Z. Now the winding, if you imagine, measure it in radians, if it's 2 pi, you should get lambda to the power 4. So basically, uh, you divide by 2 pi, so it's 4 over 2 pi. Maybe better, it's 2 over pi. So winding, if, if the total number of turns, so each 90 degree turns, turn gives us factor of lambda, each minus 90 degree turn to the right gives us lambda to the power minus so on. And also a remark I want to make is that, uh, uh, well, if for example I have a picture like this with A and B, then in this picture uh, winding from B and winding from A will always be the same because the two curves don't intersect. So if you twist, you twist both halves. So here, here, uh, winding from uh, B to Z is equal to winding from A to Z. So you can just use any of the halves of the curve. But of course, if 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 A and B are on a sort of not aligned, then, uh, then, for example, in this picture, they will always differ by 90 degrees. So es 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 essentially, winding from A and winding from B always differ by a constant, which is just how twisted is the boundary between A and B. So basically, uh, in general, general winding from uh, A to Z is equal to winding from well, winding of gamma from A to Z is equal to winding of gamma from B to Z plus winding of boundary of our domain. Now, let me think. So here, uh, from B to A. Or from A to B. Yeah, from B to A. Unless, unless uh, from B to A, no, 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 no. I, well, I, I, yeah, I have to put two pi there. Yeah, so it's something like, uh, yeah. Well, anyway, this, this is, this is. Uh, this is basically a constant independent of Z. Uh, 
so it doesn't doesn't really matter uh, what uh, what is important for us is that eventually we'll start drawing this curve starting from point A to prove that it is a CLE. And then it's, it's more beneficial for us just to look at the winning of the right part because it doesn't change when we draw the curve from the left. And if we draw it from the left and count it from the left, it has to change. We have to put some factor in and trace it. And it, it's, it's a bit more complicated. But, but generally, we just count the weight from, from B to A. OK, that's the first remark. So uh, basically, so that the, what, what I want to say that combinatorially this definition is logical because it behaves nicely as we draw a curve or if we attach loops, it doesn't change. Now uh, uh, we have complete freedom now what to choose here as a weight. And maybe I want to do another remark uh, before why, why, why in the first place one would want to choose such weight. So it's, uh, it's, it's another remark, a second remark. So it's the so-called, let's say, Baxter's, Baxter's trick. Uh, so uh, the complex weights of turns, uh, they were introduced uh, maybe first by Baxter when he looked at the model, at the loop models like these ones, and tried to uh, make them local. So, uh, uh, so the Baxter's trick allows to, so this model has non-local weights because we count number of loops. So we have to see the whole picture to count the loops. I cannot just say that the weight of the right half of the picture is something because I don't know how it connects to the left one. So, uh, uh, and uh, Baxter came up with a way to make such weights of n weights local by using the complex numbers. So basically, Baxter's tricks goes like that. So we have a loop model. So let's say we start with a loop model. For example, uh, z is equal to sum of square root of q to the power number of loops. Now what we do, we uh, orient loops. So uh, if in our first model we had loops which were non-oriented, uh, now we have loops which have some orientation. But then we have to uh, mm, propose what are the weights of those loops. So we, we have a complex, we, we have a partition function. And of course, the first idea is just orient them randomly with weight one half and do this. But it's still non local and uh, nothing nice comes out of it. So we don't do this. Instead, we do the following uh, complex height function, which is the sum of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, mu to the power number of oriented loops. Uh, and basically, what, what I do, I, I do the weight of a loop is mu if it's counterclockwise, and mu inverse when it is clockwise. So basically, this is called a plus one loop. And this is called a minus one loop. And then uh, I choose mu in such a way that mu plus mu inverse is equal to square root of q. Because if I choose it that way, here each oriented loop, each, each loop, each non-oriented loop here can be either oriented clockwise, gives us mu inverse, or counterclockwise gives us mu. So if we forget orientation, we return back. Now, how do we satisfy this condition? And uh, the easiest, uh, of course, a way to see it. So it's uh, uh, to do if 
I take square root of q over 2 number uh, to take mu to be equal square root of q over 2 plus i, uh, well, let's say i y. So it's a unitary number. And then mu inverse will be the conjugate number on the unit circle. So to do this, we take mu, which is square root of q over 2 plus i y. But we want mu to have absolute value of 1, so that mu inverse is equal to mu bar. So this, this works. Uh, so this, this works as long as, uh, well, this number square root of q over 2 is between 0 and 1, or between minus 1 and 1. So this works if uh, square root of q, the weight per loop, belongs to interval minus 2, 2. So if you have a model where weight of loop is between 0 and 2, so q belongs to 0, 4, this works nicely. If q is bigger than 4, and you know that at 4 this model changes, then what you get that you, you can still solve this quadratic equation. This is a quadratic equation. But you get a, a real number. You don't have two complex conjugates. So you immediately see that something goes very differently that instead of uh, complex weight per loop, you get purely real weight per loop. Now, OK. So now I uh, told you Baxter's trick, but uh, uh, well, OK, we have complex weights, but why they are local? I did not tell you. So there is, there is actually already one plus, because uh, you have here, instead of this picture, you have that picture with oriented loops. And picture with oriented loop is slightly nicer. It looks like a geographic map. So geographic map has this sort of, if you have a mountain, it has this sort of lines, which are, say, height 100 meters, 200 meters. And they're always oriented. They tell you whether you have a mountain if they're oriented counterclockwise. So if they're oriented clockwise, you have not a mountain, but, but instead a whatever, crater of a volcano or something. So geographic map doesn't, doesn't have just loops. It has loops oriented to tell you what kind of uh, geographical landscape you have. It goes up or down. But why this is local? So this is local for very simple reasons. So, uh, so this uh, loop, so what is the meaning of a loop when you go around? 2 pi and weight uh, is equal to what? Uh, mu, uh, mu. So what you can do, you, you can take a uh, weight of this turn uh, to the left uh, uh, to be uh, mu to the power 1 quarter and weight of the turn to the right mu to the power minus 1 quarter. And then uh, weight of a loop is just the product along the loop of the weight of the term. So to calculate the weight of the loop, you just go around the loop. And for each left turn, you take mu to the power 1 quarter. For each right turn, you take mu to the power minus 1 quarter. And uh, if the loop is counterclockwise, you get mu. If it's clockwise, you get mu to the power minus 1. So this, this gives you uh, mu if you have counterclockwise and mu minus 1 if it's clockwise. So the conclusion is that this complex partition function is the sum of all configurations, oriented loops, over product over all sides this uh, uh, mu to the power plus minus one quarter, depending on which turn you have, left or right. So you take all the turns. So you get, you get a completely local function. So it, I can cover half of the picture and calculate what is the partition function. So those are, those are two uh, big advantages. First, we get a geographic map so we can define height function. So we can define a function which changes by plus minus 1 each time you cross the loop. And uh, height function is nice because 
well, conjecture it converges to free field. We don't know it yet, but uh, it does. And also, the function is local. Now, of course, if, if you gain something, you should lose something. So what do we lose? We lose, uh, we had the real function, we have a complex function. And we worked in the probability space. If you have a probability space and you work with a uh, real probability measure, everything is as, as we are used to. Now you have a complex measure. So when you work with a complex probability measure, it's, it's, it's a bit uh, shaky. For example, uh, well, we, we are very much accustomed to write things like expectation of uh, f bar is equal to expectation of f bar. And it's true if the measure is real. Because if the measure is real, it just says that integral of f bar d mu is equal to uh, integral of f d mu bar. But it sort of suppose, assumes that d mu bar is equal to d mu, which is not in general true. Also, uh, obviously, when you, we add these complex things, the measure becomes bigger. So variation of this measure is much bigger than variation of the previous measure. Because it has complex part, which cancels out if you go back. So if it cancels out when you go back, it means that here mass, total mass of measure is not one. Total mass of measure is very big. And the bigger is piece of light, the more it is. So you, you, you lose this, uh, you lose control over total mass, you lose, uh, uh, you lose different uh, things like that, which, well, I mean, it's, this is not in itself a problem. It's a problem of uh, trying to prove something because it's very easy to make a mistake if, 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 you, uh, if you are accustomed with real measures. But, but uh, and this is another motivation. This is basically I, uh, <clears throat> I brought this up as a motivation. And uh, this is another motivation why uh, complex weights per turn uh, could make sense. Because it's a nice way, way to make local our weights. So it also makes sense to make these complex weights per turns not only for our interface but for other loops. But uh, we, we won't need it. OK. And maybe before we go to the break, I'll just formulate a big conjecture, so it's, which, which I cannot prove. Uh, so uh, has Hugo mentioned six vertex model in your, your talk? Yes? OK. Uh, has he mentioned these complex weights? He also mentioned complex weights. Ah, okay. So he for well, then why why do why did I do this? Uh, so well, okay. To remind, uh, so uh, so the big conjecture is that uh, well, so, so he mentioned that also these uh, complex weights uh, they have another real projection on six vertex model. This was mentioned. Yes. Okay. So the the big uh, uh, so the big conjecture. So there is so the big conjecture. Uh, the big conjecture is that uh, for q between 0 and 4, if we take uh, height function, take height function, uh, so height function, height function for this complex partition function converges as mesh goes to 0 through the Gaussian free field. Well, it has some constant in front, uh, so let's say constant which depends on Q times the Gaussian free field. And uh, this conjecture, well, it belongs to uh, Dutch physicist Bernard Nienhaus. So he formulated it for all loop models. And for all loop models, uh, there, is, uh, there is some subtlety here, because you take complex probability measure, uh, and in the limit, you have real measure. So you assume that in this limit, also this complex part disappears. But in our particular case at hand, complex part doesn't really exist in the very beginning, because if you write it as a as a six vertex model, if you write it as a six vertex model, so it's, uh, uh, let's say, so what, what kind of error configurations we can have? There are two types essentially of error configurations. There is configuration like that, and there are four, four rotations of this configuration. 
And then uh, there is a, uh, uh, and this can be split into loops only in two ways, like this. And then there are two configurations like that. So let, let me just, so basically there are, So if you forget how arrows are connected, this is always uh, uh, the same, these two. And this is like that. And in terms of height function, uh, which I would draw here in yellow, this corresponds to having height function h, uh, h plus 1, h plus 2, h plus 1, or uh, h, h plus 1, h, h plus 1. So basically there are pictures where height function is flat and there is a picture when it is a saddle. And now the weights, if you draw, if you put the weights which we have, so what is the weight of this picture? We have a left turn and a right turn. So the weight of this picture is mu 1 quarter for this turn, mu to the power minus 1 quarter for this turn. We take a product and the weight will be mu to the, well, it will be just 1 for all these four pictures. And here the weight is mu to the power one quarter, mu to the power one quarter twice, mu to the power minus one quarter right turn, mu to the power one minus one quarter. So here the weight is uh, mu square root of mu, and here square root of one over mu. And we have to sum them, and if we sum them, so it uh, will be here weight one, and here weight uh, square root of mu plus square root of mu inverse, which is real because we sum two, uh, two conjugate numbers. So this is the important thing that this is real. And it's some function of q, by the way. So in principle, in our case, in Fk, case we can do height function for a partition function for six vertex model which is purely real. So this is a big conjecture and uh, I don't know how to prove it. Uh, well otherwise it wouldn't have been a conjecture. Uh, now uh, there are uh, there has been a lot of activity around six vertex model because you see uh, well, we just said that uh, FK model can be written as loops, loops can be written as six vertex so it's one can rewrite everything in terms of six vertex and also in six vertex so here we had four weights one and two weights uh, mu plus mu inverse square roots. Uh, in principle you can take different six weights and people extensively studied this and uh, we are in, uh, with these weights, we are in the regime which is chaotic. It also has ordered regime. Uh, and there was, uh, over the last three years, there was much programs in the ordered regime by Baradin and uh, Corvin and uh, Petrov and others. Uh, uh, and uh, one of the spectacular things uh, they have proven is that uh, in the ordered regime, not, not, not for these parameters I have, Basically, to get into this, their parameters, one has to take two of the weights of these four weights here and make them much larger. Then uh, they prove that in their case, there have fluctuations of these height functions, which are not free field, but KPZ, Kardar paris jean fluctuations. So KPZ is the, the fluctuations which you see in the coffee stains on the boundary of a coffee stain or in a burning piece of paper. So it's, it's a different universality class from from what we are discussing. Uh, and uh, now this, this is sort of a big area. Ideally, one would want to understand fluctuations of height functions for six vertex models by, by, some, by some general general approach. So it's, uh, okay, so let's maybe uh, go for the break here and then we'll start uh, the proof afterwards. So what Hugo did say about six vertex model? Or nothing. Ah, he showed he showed this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Ah. Okay. 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 So so as, as essentially what what usually maybe let me 
Uh, okay, let me maybe erase this. <coughs> So the usual six vertex model. Uh, so usually people write uh, weights. Uh, let me see. So this is A1, A2. So this is basically along this diagonal. Now it can be along other diagonal. And it's B1, B2. And then there are C1, C2, which are the ones where it's not along the diagonal. And then in principle, in principle, you can add sources and sinks. So this is called eight vertex model. Then you can add sources and sinks D1, D2. Now, why they come in pairs, A1, A2, B1, B2? Well, it's clear why D1 and D2 come in pairs. Because if you do it on a torus, then the number of sources is equal to the number of sinks. So in principle, if you do it on a torus, it's not really important what are the individual weights. It's important their product. Because if you have seven sources, you have seven sinks. So the important thing is uh, important really D, which is equal to D1, D2. So it's really, you, you can, can assume, so we can can, usually we can assume d1 equal d2. And in these two situations, is this, is this three situations is also the same. You can, you can uh, by changing every direction of every other arrow, you can convert picture C into sources and sinks and get the same identity. Or converting other ones, you can get pictures B, or you can just do some combinatorial counting. So it's, it's always, uh, so uh, on a torus, Number of A1 is equal to number of A2. Number of B1 is equal to number of B2, etc. So we usually, usually people assume that uh, A1 is equal to A2, and B1 is equal to B2, and C1 is equal to C2. Now, uh, what, what else? is that we can normalize, we can divide by C, just normalizing everything. Also, we can uh, normalize so that A, B, C become A over C, B over C, 1, just by dividing the weight of all nodes by C. So basically, this is the picture of the space of this six vertex model. And uh, so we, what we discussed, we, what we do, is A equal B equal 1, and C belongs, uh, C belongs in our case, what is C? So we have. Uh, so if we have mu which goes here, so this is the range of mu, because mu, mu, mu plus uh, mu inverse gives mu plus mu inverse gives square root of q, then where, where will we have square root of mu? Square root of mu will go from here to here. So square root of mu plus square root of mu inverse will go between uh, uh, so between here and here. So it's and we we multiply by two. So it will go between square root of two and two. So it's just a simple calculation from that blackboard. So c belongs to square root of two two, and if we divide by c, we have a over C is equal to B over C and belongs to uh, ba, 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 1 half 1 over square root of 2. So we, uh, let me just put 1, 
one. Uh, one half is here, so there is a so there is a circle here. So this is this is what we discuss. This is the interval we discuss. So we are basically on this interval. And uh, the general the general picture, as as people uh, believe is that uh, there is the chaotic regime, well, disorder, let's say, disorder. And then there are three ordered regimes. So it's order, people usually say ferroelectric or ferromagnetic. So people here write disorder, and here people write ferroelectric, ferroelectric. Ferroelectric. So the big conjecture, as, as I formulated, we 100% believe that it's true on this interval. And uh, I don't know, 80% believe that it's true the whole line. And it's actually whole, true in the whole strip, but only a bit skewed. So if you go to the side of the strip, if you change a compared to B, it means basically that you look at, it's like looking at percolation or easing model which is stretched in one direction. So what, uh, if you, at this point, you should have Gaussian free field but stretched in one direction. And here you should have order and, uh, well, what, what Baradin did, Baradin, Baradin did part of line just below this one and uh, there they have slightly different fluctuations at large scale. But on small scale, they also should have Gaussian fluctuations. So this, this is a, a model which, uh, which includes not only what ever we spoke about, but also some other regimes, these ordered regimes, which have very, very interesting things. But their, their methods uh, are very different from what we do. It's basically related to transfer ma matrix and beta algebraic beta ansatz. So you, you do your model, let's say, in quadrant or in a cylinder, and you go from left to right, and you see how height function changes, and you do this by analyzing uh, transfer matrices. OK, so this is just putting it in proper perspective. So what, what we are doing now, we are living in this. And actually, the easing model, it corresponds you should take square root of this number, so we should get point in the middle of this. So you, we're actually doing some one point in the middle of this interval. And the uniform spanning tree is, which we already did, it corresponds to this end of this interval. Okay. Okay, let's, let's have a break and then. But this, this, this is, uh, OK, so to put it in proper perspective for those who might want to a nice problem, uh, it might be difficult, but it might be that for some special values of Q, there is a nice trick to do it. It's unknown for Q for two values. OK, so it's unknown for all values of Q. It's unknown for all values Q. So, the, so this conjecture is uh, uh, open for all values of Q. So open, open all Q. So the only Q for which it is sort of uh, known in some sense is for uniform spanning tree. But for uniform spanning tree, you don't have any loops. You have only one space filling loop. So the height function is trivial. It's uh, 0 on black <laughs> and 1 on white. So what is known for uniform spanning tree is that the winding of the tree corresponds to Gaussian free field. And uh, the winding of the tree itself, that's the theorem of Rick Kenyon. And, uh, uh, it might be that for all other values of Q, it is a hybrid of these two things, that uh, for all other values of Q to prove this theorem, you have to work together with height function and winding of, the, of this picture in some sense. And together they will give, one will give you, so together they will give like complex Gaussian free field. One will give you real part, another will give you imaginary part, something like that. But that's, that's again, so that's, 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 a, that's a speculation. Uh, yeah, so that's open. And for Q, yeah, Q equals 0. Q equals 0 is UST. 
And Q equal 4, it's uh, not known, but it's kind of related to double dimers in the same universality class, and for diber dimers it is known. Yeah, so it's, it's not, yeah, so it's not known for any, it's open for any value of Q. For Q equals 0, it's not true, because for Q equals 0, its height function is trivial, but, uh, but otherwise, uh, other, other, otherwise it is, uh, it is wide open, yeah. Okay, so let's have a 10 minute break. Q equals zero. Yeah, yeah so a break. Okay, so about the six vertex model, so it's, it's indeed a thing which is fairly easy to formulate. So we take this model, say, on a torus or on a plane, uh, assuming that there is a large volume limit, and we put here weights 1, 1, 1, 1, and then uh, something between square root of 2 and 2. And then we should get a Gaussian free field, which in particular means that correlations between points, they are harmonic functions, so they logarithmically decay, so it's uh, a priori something one should be able to see on the lattice, just we don't know how. But uh, yeah, that's, 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 that's the thing. Okay, so let's, let's return to our case, uh, and uh, so I'll just erase this. So I just gave two pieces of motivation why, why one should uh, look at the winding of the interface, and one is that you can easily control it, another is that it relates to the Baxter trick, which, which works nicely for, uh, to, to evaluate partition function in some cases. So we have uh, now this parameter lambda. So once, once, once again, just take our chalk. So once again, we have a uh, picture which goes something like this. And we defined uh, f of z to be the expectation that z belongs to gamma, and then lambda to the power number of turns, turns of uh, gamma from b to z. So this is point b, this is point a, and for example, there is is somewhere here. So we just count number of turns on this part. Uh, so what we want to do, we want to show that function f is discrete analytic in some, in some sense. So we want, we want to have uh, some local relations for this function. And we still have one parameter to play with. We have parameter lambda. Uh, and in principle, we have another parameter. We have parameter q because uh, we just want to show it for some model, not necessarily for easing, so we have to find a pair of Q and lambda where it works nicely. So, uh, well, unfortunately, unfortunately, it only works nicely for, for the easing model, but for the easing model, nevertheless, it works. Uh, so, uh, basically, uh, what uh, we can do, we want to uh, show some discrete relation, so we can uh, take, uh, for example, a vertex here, and compare values of f for its uh, four neighbors. So this is, uh, this is basically the, the setting. So we have a piece of our lattice. We have four points which are mm, neighbors of a given point, let's say west, uh, east, north, and south. And we want to uh, deduce uh, some uh, relation. So we want uh, we want a relation for uh, points f of uh, south, f of east, f of uh, north, f of west. Now, what we can do, uh, much like for the uniform spanning tree. We can try to write some bijections between the configurations. 
Uh, and uh, the easiest thing we can do, but also essentially it's the only thing we can do, others they become much more difficult to control, is to rearrange connection at point Z. So for example, if we had connection like this, we can change the train tracks and then it goes around. So essentially, this is, uh, covers everything we can do at point Z. So uh, what, what happens is that uh, uh, how we can pass through a point Z. We can pass through it once. So we, we go, we go, 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 and then we arrive, then we leave, and then we go to the point B. But then in this case, we can change the tracks. So if, if we arrived once, then it means that there was, there was some, some loop here. So what we can do, we can change the tracks. And then uh, instead of arriving, well, it was here. Uh, instead of arriving twice, we leave. We go back and we pass through it again. So that was uh, points west, east, south, north. South, east, north, and west. And the thing which can happen, uh, uh, well, there are only well, there are these two pictures, and there are four variations on them because we could arrive from uh, uh, different uh, sides. So it's uh, uh, basically we can arrive from south and leave west, or we can arrive from south, leave east. We can arrive from north, leave west. We can arrive from north, leave east. So there are four different variations. We cannot arrive from west. So if we, in one picture, we arrive from south, we can arrive from west because uh, our lattice can admit a uh, chessboard covering. So when we go, black is always on the left. So if, if uh, uh, we can arrive from south, then we can also arrive from north, but not from west and east. So there are a total of four pairs of pictures. Now, uh, what are the uh, contributions of these two pictures to our function at four points? Uh, so uh, first of all, there is some weight which comes uh, in because, because we have other cycles. So let's, let's just de denote this weight by x. So this uh, picture contributes some big number x uh, to point south times the winding and big number x times the winding to the point west. So if this picture, the first picture, so let me just denote them, 1 and 2. So if the picture 1 contribute x to the f of south, then to the west it will contribute x times one more turn to the left. So x times lambda. And it will contribute 0 to to other things. Now, uh, what happens with the picture number two? So the two points south, you have exactly the same winding, so it also contributes x. But there is a difference in number of cycles in these two pictures. So the first picture has one more cycle. So it's weight square root of q more. So let me maybe put it square root of q here. Let's square root of q here, x square root of q. And now the question, for example, what we have here for the west. Uh, do we have the same winning as before? Yes, we do, because it doesn't really matter whether you make this detour or not. You still turn the same number of times. So you make many extra turns, but they all cancel out. So here would be the same thing, x times lambda. Now, what do you have for east? 
you have the same meaning to, to s, but then you make one more turn right. So it's x lambda inverse. And for the north, uh, well, it's slightly more complicated. So we have here, and then we go, 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 and we make basically two turns left. So two turns left is x lambda squared. So, so base, base, basically, well, if, if, if I do it graphically that this is east, west, north, and south, then the contribution of to a factor of x will be uh, one, uh, 1 plus square root of q uh, lambda times 1 plus square root of q. Uh, and then it's what? Lambda inverse here and lambda squared there. So it's basically, well, if I put a slit here, then when I go around, I have 1, 1 plus square root of q, 1 plus square root of q again, 1. And I multiply by lambda each step when I go around. And there are four pairs of pictures like that. I can put this slit in this direction, but in two other directions. And then it will be just a rotated picture. So there is uh, this picture. So there is this picture plus 4 plus its rotations. So one, one can check that uh, indeed you just have the, uh, the rotations. Yeah, and then that is times some x. And now, now, in principle, one, I mean, there are several ways to proceed. So we want some relation. Uh, uh, well, what, uh, what happens with our lattice is that, uh, mm, well, we have a function which is defined on edges. So edges in itself, they form this lattice latated by 45 degrees. But essentially, we're trying to get a relation around every vertex. So in principle, if we just get here cauchy riemann relation like before that this difference is equal to that difference times i, that won't quite do because we'll have it only for half of the places. So we'll have to get something more. And basically what happens is that we can get it for easing. And for easing, it turns out that we actually have something more because we have some additional piece of information because of the specific value of lambda. So that, that is, that is uh, uh, what, uh, what we'll do. So let, let me see. Uh, or maybe even better yet, uh, yeah, OK, so lemma. Actually, I, I would just, I would do not Kashirim. Well, one can also do Kashirim, but Fn plus Fs is equal to F west plus F east. And do we have, uh, wait a second, so do we have, as I've written it, do we have also the usual Kashirim? I always forget, yeah. So that holds if we choose lambda appropriately. 
and q is q for the easing. So let's 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 see which uh, which lambda we need. Uh, so we need that contribution of uh, uh, so for this equation star. So the contribution of a pair of configurations to star can be written in our specific case f south plus f north this is x times 1 plus square root of q uh, plus uh, lambda squared and the question is whether it's equal to x times uh, east plus west lambda inverse plus lambda times 1 plus square root of q. So if I rewrite it and move everything to the left, so it's lambda squared minus lambda times 1 plus square root of q plus 1 plus square root of q plus lambda inverse. Well, that's, that's I, that I don't quite like. Uh, let's just write lambda cube minus lambda squared 1 plus square root of q plus 1 plus lambda 1 plus square root of q. Uh, sorry? Ah, oh, yeah, indeed. Yeah. Oh, well, it's already there, yeah. And this actually uh, can be nicely factored. Uh, can be nicely factored as lambda minus one times lambda squared minus lambda one squared plus one plus one. Uh, did I do it correctly? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. No. Yes. Yeah. Or in principle, if we assume that uh, square root of q is mu plus mu inverse, uh, then here we'll have uh, 1 plus mu plus mu inverse. Ah, oh, wait a second. There is no uh, 1. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I, I, I cannot factor cubic polynomials. Yeah, yeah that's, that's like that. Yeah, I was just. Thinking why am I right? So if, if we write it like that, then we, we actually can factor it out as lambda minus 1, uh, lambda minus mu, lambda minus mu inverse. So basic, basically, the solution is lambda should be equal to 1 or mu or mu inverse. So basically, for every value of q, we have three values of lambda where we get one non-trivial relation. But again, one should understand that we have uh, a number on every edge, and we have a relation on every vertex. So there are twice more edges than vertices, because there are from every vertex there is edge up and to the right. So we have uh, only half of relations compared to our variables. So this is not enough. It still gives us something, an, an analog, uh, continuous analog would be that if you have a vector field and you know that it's divergence free. So it's a flow of liquid which without sources of things. It doesn't determine it uniquely from boundary values. You can, if you have boundary values that, for example, there is no flow through the boundary and there is a sink here and source here, you can just build a straight pipeline or a curvy pipeline and you can define many things. But it's, it still gives you some global information. So it's still, from this, you can still do, do, uh, deduce some global information like, uh, so if you, you can really write it as divergence free, then you can that, uh, flow through every contour is zero, but you cannot reconstruct a function uniquely from boundary values. So I need something more. 
And it happens that for uh, you, you one can experiment with other models. It doesn't happen, but for using something more uh, happens uh, if you take mu. So it's well, okay. So it's lambda is equal to one mu mu inverse. So we we would actually take this one and. Uh, what happens uh, for easing? So one can view it differently. One can also check that for this value there will be another relation. Uh, but uh, the other way one can view it that uh, we have a relation, which is a complex relation because we have complex coefficients there. So there are these this complex lambda. But it is so it's it's actually complex relations to real relations. Real parts are zero equal and uh, uh, imaginary parts are equal. But the numbers here. In fact, will all be uh, well, so to say, real numbers. They will have well-defined argument, uh, which uh, uh, and this this is specific to the easing model. Yeah, yeah. By the way, yeah. So I uh, rolling a little bit back. So I checked it for one pair of configuration, but all four other pairs will be exactly the same. Only the where you multiply lambda, it sort of shifts around, so it doesn't sort of if clear from this picture that it just shifts cyclically, and we have. Cyclical relation. Okay, so uh, so that was lemma one. So let's say lemma two. So we now from now on we take if q e equal two. Lambda is equal to so mu inverse. So it's it's basically uh, lambda is uh, well let's say uh, exponential of minus i pi over four. So it's this vector lambda. Then on every edge, argument of f is predetermined as on this picture. So it's just a periodic picture of what argument of f will be. So I will, so suppose that point b is here. So I start, uh, well, not maybe, let me say, argument of f is, yeah, argument of f is predetermined. So uh, let me just uh, write that, so if I, if I am on this edge and I start my perimeter here, then when I arrive here, there is no winding whatsoever. So f is real, argument is zero. So I will just write that f is, is real, so it's, uh, uh, well, maybe I'll write number f uh, is as, as on, on the picture. So I'll just write that f over something I put on the each edge is real. So here is number one. Now, here I turn right, so it will be lambda inverse. Here I turn left, <laughs> it will be lambda. Here it's again one, mm. lambda inverse, i, lambda, lambda, lambda inverse, lambda inverse, lambda, one i, uh, i, one, one. And why is it uh, so that you always get the same thing? So to every edge, uh, so the proof so we arrive with with a yellow uh, so take chessboard covering, consider consider chessboard. 
covering. We arrive with yellow on the left. Why? Because we always turn left to right, so we always follow this curve, so yellow is always on the left. So we always arrive from the same direction. So now if I arrive to this edge from this direction, so the only possibility is that two different arrivals, they differ by full turn, or two full turns, or five full turns. So the uh, winding differs, or can differ, by a multiple of 2 pi. Or uh, by not multiple, yeah, by multiple of 2 pi. So weight can differ. So each multiple of 2 pi gives us lambda to the power 4. So weight can differ by a power of lambda to the power 4. And what is lambda to the power 4? It's this number to the power 4. So exponent of minus i pi over 4 to the power 4. So it's exponent of minus i pi. So it's minus 1. So basically, if this gives us weight 1, this gives us weight minus 1. And this gives us, again, weight 1. Or if, for example, this gives us weight lambda, then this would give us weight minus lambda, and so on. So basically, if I fix an h, then all the configurations either contribute some weight w or weight minus w. So for example, here, what I get is always real, because each configuration goes with plus or minus 1 coefficient. Or here, it's always imaginary, plus or minus i. Here, it's plus or minus lambda, and so on and so on. So for a vertex z, set f of z to be equal to f of north plus f of south, which is also by lemma 1, f of west plus f of east. Now, uh, what do we have? This is z, this is uh, east west, north, and south. So we have, well, it depends. It can be rotation of this picture. But basically, it's, we have here real number, here imaginary, here number, which is, uh, uh, turn right, so wait a second. So it's uh, lambda if inverse, here lambda. So here we have something proportional to 1, here proportional to i. 
So it Fn and F south are just uh, the composition of F of Z into basis 1 plus I. Because this is proportion to 1, this is uh, proportion to I. So this is uh, then uh, F of N is a real part of F of Z. Well, on this picture. On this picture, F of N is real part of F of Z. F of South is uh, I times imaginary part F of Z. But similarly, we can, uh, uh, no, it's, okay, it's West and East. And F North and F South, they're just decomposition into uh, basis of two vectors. So we either decompose into basis 1 and I, or we decompose into basis lambda and lambda inverse. So, for example, uh, f of north is a basically projection of f of z on lambda inverse. So, in general, basically f north and f south, their uh, decomposition of f of z into one i basis. And if, uh, well, sorry, no, if not f west, f east. And f north, f south, the same, but in the basis lambda, lambda inverse. And that has a corollary which will, uh, let's maybe put as an exercise which we'll discuss next time, uh, that uh, f of z, so f satisfies Cauchy-Riemann on vertices. So the, in the usual sense that this difference is equal to that difference times i. But also, one can write that f satisfies Cauchy-Riemann on horizontal edges. So if I take a piece of my lattice, the difference like this is equal to difference like that times i. And you see, horizontal edges, it's always either real or imaginary. So this difference is equal to that difference times i. So f indeed, indeed satisfies classical Cauchy-Riemann equation, but you should either restrict it to only horizontal edges or to only or to vertices with this definition. Of course, alternative to what I did was not to show that this equation is actually two equations in one, but write two different equations and check both of them. But again, using this this funny property of this of this winding. So this is what is lacking for other models. So for other models, obviously, when I choose other values of mu, it won't have property mu to the power of 4 is equal to minus 1. So it will, it will give different complex weights. Uh, and essentially, what uh, most of what I say for easing can, could be transferred to other models if only we would know some sort of uh, either such combinatorial magic or some sort of statement that, uh, say, in if we coarse grain, if, for example, we take average of our function over small boxes, like 10 by 10, then on average, horizontal edges and vertical edges would give you the same, the same uh, input in your function. That, that such sort of statements would be enough. So here we have, uh, at, we have already at scale 1 the statement that my function f of z is this vertex. It has two coordinates written nearby. 
or two coordinates in other bases written nearby. So if, if uh, some sort of statement like that, but in a weaker form it's true for other Q in the scaling limit, that, that would have been enough. Okay, so we have cauchy riemann equation. Now uh, what we need to do next time, well, we'll check first that it exists there, but also we need to figure out what are the boundary values of this function. And uh, the question is, uh, uh, again, we know, we know these properties of weights, and the, the thing to do is to check how we can control winding on the boundary. And on the boundary, we can control winding because if curve touches the boundary, it winds around as many times as the boundary itself. So winding on the boundary is exactly known because it's the winding of the boundary itself. It's just a question to figure out what this means in terms of boundary conditions. OK, so here we stop. So next lecture is next Friday. Yeah, so we have how many Fridays? Yeah, so that's, that's it. So we have how many Fridays left? So we did one extra lecture, so we don't need to do the 3rd of June, and I will be aware of the 3rd of June anyway. So I think, I think we have three Fridays left. Yeah, I think we have three Fridays. So there are four Fridays left, but the last one I, 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 I probably skipped. We had an extra lecture based on the conference. Okay, thank you. Questions?